Well, welcome everyone. Here we go. This is our second time that we've been meeting. And so uh, for our book study on comprehensive literacy for all, um, that was written by Karen Erickson and David Copenhaver. And we are so happy to have you all here with us today. We've also in the chat put the presentation, uh, the Canva presentation. So if you are a learner that needs to have that on a separate device as we go through, um, th that is there for you. And just to give us an idea of what you're hoping to learn for our chapter 11, um, and which is using assistive technology to help support literacy. And then chapter 12, which is really about organizing and working with and delivering that effective instruction. With understanding that we have kind of shook it up a little bit, we, we have started with you know, chapter one, two, and six. Now we're jumping to the end of the book. There's a method to our madness. So bear with us as we go through that. Um, but kind of what are you looking to learn uh, for this? So I'm going to go ahead and see what we have here. Some things are coming, more strategies, implementation as a curriculum director. Love that we have curriculum directors with us. It's so important to have them adapt and modify for our different lear learners. AT appropriate terms. Love that. Improved skills. Excellent. Really great um, to have some extra to have these because we'll kind of, we'll, we'll come back to these because I think it's important. So hi everybody, I'm Sharon Redman. I'm the one who's been chatting away this whole time. I'm a special education teacher by trade. I have about 30 years of experience um, in the classroom and I, a uh, special education major, gen ed major. I have my assistive technology um, master's degree as well. And I have an ATP from Resna. And currently I'm a PhD student at Penn State University. I'm part of the um, AAC leadership group, um, which is very exciting. And and I get to come here and talk to you all about um this book study and comprehensive literacy for all. So it's the best ever. So welcome. That's me, Heidi. Um, hi, my name is Heidi Brislin. I am an occupational therapist by training. I currently work as the assistive technology specialist in the Edmonds School District. Um, and then I do a little bit of work with SETSI and a little bit of work with the Olympic Education Service District um, over on the Kitsap Peninsula. Um, I believe that being able to read and write is an essential occupation and that everybody on the team needs to be incorporating um, literacy opportunities into their sessions. So that's the perspective I come from. Um, I'm the OT who always shows up with a book. So. <laughs> OSPI offers um, 25 additional clock hours um, when you do a professional growth plan. So you're going to fill out the form. It's linked um, on this slide um, and do document the project for the year. So this year you're looking at improving your skills and ability to do inter interventions with um, emergent and conventional readers. Um, put some of the strategies you're gonna try in June. You um, show your PGAP to a colleague who signs it. Yeah. Um, in Edmonds, we turn it into our human resources department, but you would need to figure out in your district kind of where it needs to go but a great way to get an additional 25 um, clock hours, so. So here's our agenda for tonight. Um, we've done kind of our introductions and kind of planning our learning as we go through. So uh, we're going to be doing chapter 11 and chapter 12 today. So chapter 11, using assistive technology effectively and how we use that to support literacy and then organizing and delivering effective instruction. And that's a tough one. Um, we only have about a half an hour for each one. So we're going to get everyone involved today in breakout rooms. And just as a reminder, next time uh, we have chapter three, and that is set for November 28th. And where we're going to be talking about alphabet knowledge, alphabet knowledge and phonological awareness, we did start breaking some of the chapters up, but we're going to 
consistently talk about how we have these combined um, groupings in our classroom and what that looks like. So um, get ready for next time. Here are just kind of some save the dates um, for coming up and remembering November 28th and then again on December 12th. So um, working through at least through the end of this year, what we're going to be working on um, and reading about. And then starting January 30th, um, jumping into reading comprehension, which I'm super, I'm excited by all of it. But that one I love. Okay. So we before we get started, we want to just do a little review. And I'm going to go through this stuff pretty quickly here. Um, Last week, we, or last time, felt like it was just last week, last month, we talked about some of this common language that both Heidi and I, you know, and I'm everyone here, you know, has strong opinions about, and that is that everyone can learn to read and write, and everyone can. We're looking at presuming that potential that starts with us being attuned to our learners and what they need. We're looking at it's not the act of writing. It's not the act of reading, but the process of learning, right? How to be an author. Always model, model, model. We do that as all my teacher friends that are here in the group um, and my, you know, all, all of us as educators, you know, we understand that gradual release of responsibility and we understand that modeling is so important. So modeling that aided language simulation to our individuals who are AAC users and then providing access to everything, right? Making sure that they have access to the general. No, you need to go away. Making sure that they have access to um, all the tools that they need to be able to read and write. And, and then those meaningful opportunities, which can be student-driven, right? Can we need to know our learners and what trips are trigger? We need to have that. And then again, accepting all communication attempts, accepting all writing attempts, accepting all reading attempts, that we then can take that and expand that. But let's start with that accepting of that multimodal. So in addition to modeling and doing that aided language stimulation, being sure you're modeling like reading and writing and what the function of that is, because I think so often we get stuck on teaching they come to school and we forget that many of these kids haven't had those early literacy opportunities. Um, and so modeling, um, you know, when you're writing, oh, I'm writing this note to your mom or just modeling like writing and reading so that they get to see that these things have a purpose and it's not just a job I have to do in school. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that I do when I was thinking of that gradual release that I do, we do, you do. So watching that I do, that's that modeling piece of what that looks like in writing. And when we get into Heidi, which is going to be one of our favorite, they're all our favorite. I, I, I keep saying our favorite one, but of writing and doing predictable chart writing. I mean, that is that purpose, right? Modeling that writing every day. So modeling, 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 I should put it all and aided language simulation, but we really need to make sure that we're modeling. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you said that. Okay. So We've had some questions and, you know, I think they're fair. I know that our gen ed peers are, um, you know, where the, the pendulum is shifting into that um, science of reading and where um, comprehensive literacy meets with that um, science of reading. So if anybody's familiar with Scarsborough's rope, reading rope, it's this idea where you were reading as a complex um, task, which we know involves reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And when we start pulling those threads apart, we start seeing the individual skills that kind of need to be put, that we can see that are coming, um, that are together in that rope that builds that rope of reading. And so I think what we do and what we have um, in the past is done pretty well on that lower strand, maybe not so much on that kind of phonological awareness and letter sound correspondence, but definitely in sight words, right? So now we're moving to this, what I love about this book is moving us into that upper strand of let's not forget about that language comprehension and what does that look like? So having this 
you know, right kind of in the sifter as we go through, right? As we're reading through and understanding that these things connect and that they may just have a few different words and uh, terminologies attached to them. But as you're talking with your gen ed peers, you can have these robust conversations about your complex learners um, within your classroom. Okay, just a quick note why we structured this. Again, we in the, we're going to talk a lot about this tonight, but it is that we can't choose which learners come into our classroom, right? We accept them all and we may have an emergent learner, reader, or writer. We may have a, a, comp, a more um uh, one that has more comprehensive, what is the word I'm looking for? Conventional, I was going to say comprehensive, conventional learner, <laughs> right, that already knows how to do some reading, already knows how to do some writing, is past that part um, and is past that emergent. And so how do we combine these approaches when we are looking at this instruction? So that's why we kind of uh, went through this book study a little different and didn't order it kind of ordinarily through the chapters, but mixed it up a little bit. Okay, what did we learn last time, Heidi? All right, well, one of the things we learned is there's no prerequisite to reading and writing. The only prerequisite is to be breathing. Mm -hmm. So um, any child can become a reader and writer. It likely will not happen overnight and it takes time. Um, some kids will pick it up uh, if you start early intervention, <clears throat> you know, in preschool. Some kids may pick it up, you know, at some point during elementary school. Um, some kids that might be all the way into high school that they need to have that cup filled and get all that like modeling and background information to be able to um, become, be, you know, become more independent readers and writers. But there's so many things we can do in the meantime to help them get there. Um, and I think. We talk about, um, you know, functional academics is some of the some of the names of the classrooms our students are placed in um, when they are in middle school and high school. And really, there's nothing more functional than literacy. So students who have literacy skills um, have better opportunities for employment options. Um, they can it makes social media tools accessible. And if you think about like during the pandemic, how we all relied on you know, social media to stay connected. You know, when these kids, many of many of our kids, when they leave the schools, they, you know, that, that is an only way for them to stay kind of connected with some of their friends. Um, it gives them the individuals to have greater choices that they can advocate over medical procedures and therapies and other important life decisions. So really the most important um, functional skill you can learn in school. So having every child leave us with being able to read and write may not look like everybody else's re way that they read and write um, really makes a long-term impact in the quality of their life. Yeah, I love how you talked about it earlier, Heidi, where really talked about that it is their occupation, it is the occupation, right? And that employment options like reading is so important to, um, for that, and for that, for that access after they're out of our K-12 system. So, yeah. So lots more that we learned. Please go back to chapters one, two, and six that we um, explored and uh, that kind of introduced and gave that foundation. But really, this is where our big takeaways. And if you have some others that um, you want to share, please do. Okay. So getting into it, chapter 11. Heidi, take it away. All right. So this is straight out of IDEA. Many of us know this. If you don't, um, uh, it's it's really good information to have when you're looking at every child. That so talking about what an AT device is. So it's any item, piece of equipment, product, system, whether acquired commercially, off the shelf, modified or customized, that is used to increase, maintain or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. So pencil grip, assistive technology, eye gaze device, assistive technology. Um, then it also- Assistive technology. Yeah. It falls in that category, right? Yeah, yep. they're all in there. 
Um, and the term assistive technology service means any service that directly assists a child with the disability in the selection, acquisition, and or use of the assistive technology device. And I had a little thing that I underlined here. Let me find it here. Is that it's not only important that students have access to the necess necessary devices, but that with that there are supports to train them how to use it. So IDA is looking at, you know, they're not expecting us to hand someone an AAC device and they can speak. You know, it's like, well, they're not using the talker, it's not working. Well, it's like, it may take years for them to use the talker. And um, it's like, they have to have that support to learn how to use the device is very important. Absolutely. I, and this just, it doesn't even go for AAC devices, even something as simple that we would think of as an, an assistive technology support, or, you know, oftentimes you hear it in an accommodation, but it's an assistive technology support of text to speech. Like we still need to teach our students how to use that tool. It's, it's not easy, right? And to be able to know when to stop, when to pause the text, how to go back and start playing, how to open up. So a lot of those, you know, functions, operational functions that are needed to be able to use that, we still need to go back and teach that. And then when to use the, that tool, right? So I comment all the time that like, I could use my phone to write a dissertation, I'm not going to do that because that sounds horrible, right? I mean, writing a dissertation is sounds like I'm scared, but sounds I would horrible. never do it on my phone. <laughs> I would never do it on this tool, right? This is a great tool, but it is not the tool for that task. So, um, and we need to know, we need to teach our children and our, our learners, really, we need to teach all of our learners, young and old on that. And so that term of assistive technology services really hits home for me because we have the tools. That's great, but we need to teach our kids how to use these tools. Okay. AT supports for reading and writing. So Heidi, you know, what are some of the things that, um, that you use, maybe just giving us example, because we're going to be going out um, and we're going to break everybody out into groups. And what I'd like them, what, when you're in your group is kind of have a note taker and you're going to have about five minutes to, to talk about some of the AT supports that you have used in your classroom um, for reading and writing and what that might look like. And then we're going to have you come back and share. So pick somebody in your group that is comfortable with speaking in front of a group and to share um, some of the things that you've done. But we kind of thought we'd start with... Um, with an example. And so Heidi, what are some things that as an OT, you know, you come into with as a support? I love that you have so that. This is a um, step-by-step um, voice output switch. It's called a little step-by-step. -step. And you can record up to four minutes of, of, of recording on them and you can do multiple levels. I would show you, but this one has to go back because it's not working. That's why it happens to be on my desk. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, I love to use this during, um, if I'm going out to do a switch assessment with someone, I love to take this out and then hook it to another switch. And then whatever site we're looking at, um, we either bring a book and do repeated phrases and have them activate. So if, if I'm looking at like a head switch, I might hold the switch that's connected to this here and have like, you know, um, there's a book I like to bring for my younger kids called Don't Touch, Don't Touch the Button. And we'll record multiple ways of saying, don't touch the button, don't touch the button, don't you touch the button. Um, and then I, as I'm reading the book with them, I have them activate um, head, elbow, knee, wherever, wherever I'm looking for, for a switch site. Um, I don't have to take a big old switch kit with me. This is all I typically take. And so I love to use these during shared reading. What type of AT supports um, have you tried or have um, that have worked, may not have worked? I've tried a lot, but I haven't. So thoughts about that. Um, <laughs> you know, I think my right now my biggest interest is, is we have a kid who's now in first grade and he has apraxia. Yeah. Uh, um, really intelligent guy, but he, you know, he hasn't had a, a specific technology to, to use. Um, 
we finally got something to the end of last year. He's using uh, Proloquo to go on an iPad. Um, and I just think, uh, I'm wondering, you know, as he is learning to read, I feel like we should be using a device as well because. Absolutely. Yeah. I know you can see us yeah. shaking our heads. But... Yeah, we're both shaking our heads. With the both, Heidi, both Heidi and I are going, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, you have this incredible device that is generating output. That's its purpose for our user, but our user doesn't necessarily know in our learner um, how to make those connections with literacy. And so being able to, one, know where they're at in their where they're at language wise, right? So are they are they early symbolic communicator or are can they with in a multimodal way, aided or unaided, you know, use one, two, three word combinations, like kind of where are they at? And then my suggestion would be is being able to use, and we'll talk a lot about this in the comprehension section, but, you know, talking about when you're doing shared, just as an example, shared book reading and being able to comment, you know, as, as me as a teacher, yeah. I'm going to comment, then I'm going to ask a question, then I'm going to, I'm going to have that pause time. And maybe I'm going to have a second device that I'm then modeling, you know, one or two words or three us, depending on where they are, I mean, that's going to be really important as where they are in their communication journey and using an AAC device, but modeling what that looks like, modeling asking a question. I think our, our AAC users, uh, you know, are so often asked to use it for needs and wants instead of being able to use it for asking questions, right? What is that? Yeah. Or, um, you know, look at that, then making a comment. And so being able to model some of that during that book reading, it's the most, I think, beautiful opportunity to bring that language and that using that device in at that time. Um, and then respond to that, having that. You bet. So <clears throat> there were a wide variety of kind of types of classrooms and roles that we have um, in our buildings, but we talked about um, kind of the kids with the most um, significant um, complex needs and the needs for switches and AAC devices and um, wheelchair mounts and all the things that go with that. But we also talked about students who have um, different academic skills and <clears throat> maybe don't need that that form of assistive technology, but need um, things like the Chrome extensions if it's a if it's a Google school or whatever it may be, Snap and Read, CoWriter, Immersive Reader, Clicker Eight, those kinds of things. <clears throat> so we kind of had a discussion about that. That's great. Thanks, Renee. All right. How about? And I'm sure. Sorry for like group. I don't know how many groups did we have, Annie. We had seven. We had seven groups. So maybe by the time we get to seven, you'll hear a lot of the same things, but that that's okay. That means we're on the right track, right? So group two. I can't remember if I was group two or three. <laughs> that's okay, Jenna. Just go for it. Also, if I'm sorry if I'm taking group two, but I'll uh, call out for our group now. Um, we heard from SLPs and uh, deaf and hard of hearing teachers, and we I really liked it being termed as mid, light, and high tech, and of course, AAC's access to letter boards, Chrome, second on the Chrome extensions, um, even with uh, Google Docs using translation tools, um, but I also liked uh, buttons for accessing sounds. So for the deaf of heart and hard of hearing, she was giving buttons that had access to um, creating a sound of an animal. And, I, and then eye gaze and slant boards. And um, I'll just stop with that. That's as, that's as far as we got. That's amazing. Yeah. You only had five minutes. That's a lot. Came up with a lot. All right. Hopefully group three or possibly group two. <laughs> I, I think we were a group two, but no problem. All right, go for <laughs> <That's okay>. it, Claire. <laughs> um, 
Uh, we talked about, I think that we mentioned everything that has already been mentioned and had not a obviously in-depth discussion, but sort of chatting about the implementation. And one of my group members was talking about um, an experience that she had with an OT who was, you know, wrote out a schedule and then what specific tools they needed at specific times during the day. And I thought that that just echoed what was shared about like knowing the right tools to use at the right time. Yeah, we heard about adaptive embossed paper, yes, no buttons, um, go talker, smooth talker, um, PEX, interactive books with using like core vocabulary, um, Proloquo, even like on 365 Word with all the accessibility features, um, co-writer, snap and read, clicker eight. So lots of tech items. Lots of tools. That's yes. great. I can share for group five. Oh, thanks, Holly. Um, so along with um, some of the same things that have been said, um, in addition to that, we had adapted keyboards, adapted mouse pointers, um, and then we talked about you, the use of universal switch where you can hook up like other devices like fans and vibrating pillows and um, hair dryers. And you might have the sentence written underneath, but they can activate the switch and blow material off of it to reveal the, the sentence. Um, just different ways to have that cause effect built and have the writing be there. Um, we also talked about um, specialized pointers that are actually um, just like different kinds of erasers where they'll do reverse writing. And so on the dry erase board, it will be written for them, but then they trace to erase it. So they're almost like working backwards. Uh, in group six, we talked about a lot of these, the natural reader as well. And um, we talked about, um, we talked about using, I use an assistive pencil or a, an eight, like in chapter 11, the assistive pencil pencil in that oh, that the alternative pencil about, yeah and also sorry an alternative pencil and then we also talked about using um pod books as well and in group six we and we talked about um what else did we talk about guys i think that was and we taught i'm just trying to read on here to make sure i don't copy um and speech to text so like the read write toolbar yeah yeah yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And Patello for reading. Yeah. Having those tools. That's great. Well, and yeah. I, I love to use like the AAC. Um, and core, core, core boards and also yeah. news to you. Those were the things we talked about. Sorry. That took me a second. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Uh, and I love to use like the AAC devices. Like if we're doing like shared writing, it's like for an animal, yeah. you know, go to either, either I, I'm, I have a pod book that I'm, pro, I'm more, most proficient with and I whip out my book and we go to animals or I have their AAC oh my gosh. To animals and, and then they can yeah. do what they want for and, their structured chart writing. Yeah. And we were talking about using news to you, not always for practicing reading skills, but kind of to talk about how, um, like in relation to the news and like what's going on in the world and like as a communicate a communication activity and the communication boards that we use with those so students can kind of have a way to talk about what's going on. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Really Thank good. You. Yeah. And last group. I think did we have a group seven? I think that was just group seven, maybe. Oh, was that group seven? I thought that was group six. No, sorry. Okay. Do we miss somebody? That was group six. Okay, group seven. Sorry about that. Well, group seven, um, since nobody nobody's jumping in. Um, you can do a gale. About a lot of the same pieces. Um, Co-writer came up with a couple of people. I used SnapType and was talked to about SnapType Pro 2, so I'll be looking that up. Um, and I'm in a resource room setting. My kids really, really, um, appreciate being able to show what they know, not what they can or are willing to write. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, you guys sure came up. Thank you, Gail, for that. You guys came up with an amazing list. Um, 
And of course, what we know, which we're going to be going through here in a little bit, and we're running low on time, so I'm going to speed it up. But um, when we talk about assistive technology and going through the set process that we, you know, we, I know we talked about the tools first, but we're always starting with our student first. So um, we'll go that, but what a great list of tools that we can do that our assistive technology supports. So, you know, here's what, and this kind of leads into this, that these decisions about this assistive technology that we have, we, it's good that we know what um, different tools are out there, but they need to be paired with those instructional goals and what the users are needing. And they also talk a little bit about avoiding symbolic text, um, symbolating supported text. And I just, I, I getting on a little, I'm gonna jump over onto my little like soapbox here. So here's what we know about picture supported text. We know we've all done it. If you've been in the field for a while, Heidi, have you done it? Yep, we've done it. I have millions of books that I have done and when we thought that this was a great tool to use. And now what we know is that picture supported text actually deters reading. It doesn't help. It makes it harder for our learners to learn how to read. That doesn't mean that we don't use visual supports and for to help with reading, but we are not symbolating text. And I couldn't believe it when I went on like Teachers Pay Teachers and I saw that there were close to 8,000 resources for symbolating text. So what we know in the research is that this does not support reading. We thought it did, and we all went in with great intentions, but we know that it doesn't. And so now that we know better, we just have to do better. So I really encourage if you use tools in your district and different curriculums that have um, picture like supported or symbolated text, you can turn that feature off. And I just really encourage you to learn a little bit more about that. So. Okay. So one, uh, one comment, Sharon, quick. Someone said yeah. it's challenging, especially with unique news to you. I did talk to the rep about that. And you can go into a level and actually turn the symbols off. Yes, you can. You can. I think it's at a certain level. So if you're in a, and I, I don't, I haven't used it in a while, but at a certain level, you can go in and turn those, those off. So we just, just to, you know, now we know better. And so then we do better. Yeah. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the set process here. Um, and so how, give me a little thumbs up in your um, window or in the chat. How many, um, how many of you use the set process when you're looking at AT consideration? So it's basically when we, it was um, created by Joy Zambala and you look at the student, the task, the environment, I mean, the student environment task and tools, I should be, I've done it like four times today already in consult. So anybody use it? I've got Mary that says, yes, she uses it. Anybody else? Oh, Maureen, first time hearing it. Well, you are in a great place to hear all about it. This is great. Okay. So I don't know if we want to go to my form or if you want to go over the... Yeah, I just kind of wanted to mention in the book, they talk about this idea and someone had mentioned it as a tool as well of like, here is this, they talk about this red, yellow, and green as far as like what's important. And in this section where they talk about this yellow, red, yellow, and green chart, they're really looking at like, what is the cognitive load and all the whole load that is happening because it's hard to use assistive technology tools, right? And so what is the load for that task? And so they've gone in and um, looked at how you can set that up through the day so that you can be like, here's the most important thing that we need to be focusing on and doing right now um, when it comes to using any of the AT tools that are in this child's toolkit. So I, I encourage you to use that. I've tried a little bit with that. Um, I've had to kind of adjust and adapt and, but take a look in that. Um, someone else mentioned that they had used doing something like that. So I think that that's really great. Okay. Oh, I keep doing that. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is linked and I'm gonna share it with you. We've used a variety of versions of the set process here in Edmonds. And this year we're kind of 
we, we, we kind of combine several different versions that we find out there. And um, we've been, we've always done kind of a set process whenever we do an AT consult with the whole team. Um, but this we've been using this year and it's been really, really great. Um, we kind of just put some guiding information so we remember to ask about some of these things. And if they're not appropriate, we just delete it on the spot and we share the screen and go through it. And then we list like, the tools, who's responsible, if there's any training that needs to happen. And then at the bottom, there's a, if you scroll down a little bit more, um, our most frequently recommended resources um, is um, hyperlinked for everybody. And it has a lot of the um, comprehensive literacy for all um, supports there. Um, do you mind just clicking on that? Sure. Yep. And then if you, so you can just kind of see what all is on there. And one thing I'd recommend if you, if you look at nothing else on this page, right under literacy, where it says overview video from Setsi, um, Brenda Del Monte has done a YouTube um, module. It's seven minutes long and it gives you about seven or eight different strategies to work on teaching literacy skills. Definitely worth the seven minutes of your time to to watch that you will have so many ideas from that. And so, um, Sharon, can you share the link for this um, in the chat? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, I can do that. And let me do that. And then, but it is, like I said, hyperlinked within yep. that, um, within the, within our slide, within our slide deck. Yeah, the set process is amazing. I just saw um, on here that Mary said that she uses it for her team and, and it really helps everyone get involved. Yeah. Um, yeah. Copenhaver wrote this book. And when you talk, when he talks about that comprehensive literacy instruction, it, it's okay to do it imperfectly because it's way better than having perfect instruction in just one area, right? Now, with that said, it's... I mean, one area is better than no areas at all, right? So if 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 it is too overwhelming, like we you need to start somewhere, right? But it's okay to make mistakes because it our students need and us to step up and have this instruction happen daily. So um so what do we know? So we need we know we need to know our learners, right? We need to be attuned to them. We need to know them as learners, as communicators. Where are they in their development of language, in their development um, of and how they are as a an, if they're an AAC user and what that means as far as are they emergent? Are they um, pre-symbolic? Are they symbolic? Are they past that? Are we going into morphology? Where are we at? Or are we even, you know, we're not, I shouldn't say below, but, you know, more on the beginning, you know, emergent side of things. So we need to be attuned to our learners. And in the book, it does a really nice job of kind of breaking these out. So looking at some of these questions to make some determinations of, are you having, um, uh, is your learner uh, an emergent learner or more of a conventional learner? And then what they talk about a lot in the back of this book, how you could talk about combined groups. Now, this might be something that we actually talk about throughout this, the rest of this year as through this book study, because we're, we haven't gone through, this is chapter 12, the last chapter, and we mix it up. So we haven't talked about shared reading, reading comprehension, decoding, spelling, phonological awareness, predictable chart writing, independent writing, and self-directed reading. We haven't taken, we haven't taken the time to go through that. So maybe what we do is we add this piece in to the rest of our um, our time together this year is that we'll look at these combined approaches within each of these sections because I think it's a really important for us to look at like how do we structure our reading and writing with our students, right? We have IEPs to go through, IP goals to go through. Hopefully our kids are out in the gen ed, you know, environment and we're doing lots of really great inclusion, but we still need to have that time to do some direct instruction and where they're at with these ideas in mind and comprehensive literacy in mind. So um, I think that as we go through, 
Um, and as you go into our next chapter, our next chapter, which we're going to be talking about decoding spelling and word, that would be your homework is to kind of look at that and think about how would I combine the approach in my room um, when I'm teaching an emergent reader that's more of that, you know, phonological awareness and uh, um, letter to sound correspondence, right? Because we're really, we're, we want to work on that. And with individuals that are decoding and we're working on spelling and coding, right? So if we're working on the decoding and encoding, how am I mixing that together and doing a combined approach with our learners? So you don't, your homework isn't for everything. It's just for that one part. I I changed my mind. <laughs> so just kind of think about that of how we go about with that combined groups. In the book, so this is, you know, the, I was going to bring up this Literacy Bill of Rights that's going to be there, but kind of our ending thoughts about, um, and we'll be talking about this, I think, throughout the rest of the chapters as well, but how we organize, right? They say, Heidi, how many hour, how many like hours a day? Did it say I'm putting you on the spot? I know I didn't. I think it's like 90 to 120 minutes. And, right. That's and the teachers stuff. I work with are like, there's just no way. And, and there's, there's some way. classes that the care of the student takes so much time exactly. that that's just not going to be possible. And I talk to my teams a lot about sneaking in literacy on the fly. Yep. You know, that it doesn't yeah. have to be like this big block of time. It can be like you know, yeah. five minutes here while you're doing that or two minutes here you know, that it can just get snuck in all day. It doesn't have to be this um, block yeah. or whatever. What are some things that you took away from today? What are some things that you want to learn more about? What were maybe some aha moments? What are some questions you're going to come back on uh, next week with, or next week, next month, um, when we talk about um, phonological awareness and um, all of that good stuff. 